right. Well, you know, I hope, uh, I hope you can put up with me. There's something about a British accent and the word of God, and I've got this mixed up kind of American, Southern, Canadian thing going, and so bear with me. All right, but as Jeff said, we're continuing on with our RAIN series, and here within our series, we come to really uh, an incredibly pivotal point in not only Israel's history, but in the history, it, it begins to, to open up the doors for us to see kind of behind the cosmos into God's overall plan for human history. Now, we as people, we know that hindsight is what? Hindsight is what? 2020. But the reality is, we're in the, when, when we find ourselves kind of in the midst of a mess, when we find ourselves in the midst of a storm, in the midst of hardship, it's actually very hard to have clarity, very, very hard to see life clearly. And last week, as we were in 1 Samuel chapter 15, we find now the prophet Samuel. And we've been introduced to Samuel now for weeks. He's the, 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 the prophet judge. He's, he's working for God amidst some difficult situations. He anointed the first king. He established with, with God's help the first king of Israel. And as we've seen over these past few weeks, if you've, if you've been here, it hasn't gone well. The first king of Israel, his name was Saul. And we see incredible disobedience on his part has rejected God in so many ways. And last week, we saw this, this heartbreaking scene unfold where Samuel, towards the end of, of chapter 15, tells Saul that the Lord has ripped from your hands kingship, the kingdom. And Saul wasn't happy with that, and he's grabbing and pleading with the prophet judge to not go, and he, and he actually rips a part of, of the Samuel's clothing from him, and Samuel says, just as you've ripped clothing from me, so has God ripped the kingdom out of your hands. And now as we come to chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, we find the prophet not with clear 2020 vision, but we find the prophet a bit perplexed. We find the prophet beginning to wonder, what is God doing? I equate it to kind of, kind of this. We need to remind ourselves today. My, my daughter, she loves to do puzzles. Uh, and, and it's amazing to me. So she'll get, get our puzzle table out. She'll take, you know, a, a thousand piece, couple thousand piece puzzle, dumps it all out on the table. And honestly, it's just a mess, right? It's just a jumbled mess. It doesn't look like anything. But thankfully, there's what? A picture. A picture of what this jumbled mess is to be. And as we work through uh, not just today, but as we work through this series, I, I'm hopeful, and I know Samuel begins to see today, we begin to see that there is an all-knowing God who is sovereign and sees and is actually working out his perfect plan in history. And Samuel and the characters we're going to be introduced to today are definitely a part of God's larger story. And it actually ties in beautifully with it being Palm Sunday today, with us moving towards Easter. 1 Samuel 16 is this pivotal, crucial piece in human history where God continues to unpack his plan. God continues to build the puzzle, so to speak, of human history. So take your Bibles with me, take your tablets, take your phones, and let's go to 1 Samuel again. And here in 1 Samuel, we do find the prophet, like I said, a bit perplexed. He's a bit, a bit confused right now. And just follow along with me. I want to read for us the first 10 verses of 1 Samuel 16. Because the Lord then says to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. 
And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, this is the the first son now, looks upon Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these first thing I want us to see here this morning is that we need to recognize, as I've already said, that we serve a sovereign, all-seeing God. God has introduced this truth to us earlier on in Scripture, where we're reminded that, that He is a sovereign God who is in full control of human history and sees all things, and He sees all things very differently than we often do within our human context, within our immediate surroundings. And it's true, like I said, for Samuel. Verse 1 tells us Samuel is grieving. God has ripped the kingdom from Saul, and Samuel is grieving, and he's trying to figure out what is going on. But God now confronts him. God confronts him, and he says, look, you, you need to stop. He says, how long? How long, Samuel, are you going to grieve over Saul not being king? How long are you going to grieve over Saul's disobedience? How long are you going to grieve that the plan isn't quite shaking out the way maybe you thought it was? And God confronts Samuel, his chosen man for the time, and he says, how long? It's time to recognize God's getting on with his plan. And Samuel, you, you need to get on to it with me. Can I just pause here for a moment? I think a lot of us, if we're not careful, we can be like Samuel. Because we don't see the whole picture, when life isn't quite going our way, we can get really stuck. We can get really stuck and find ourselves in pits of despair and fear and worry. And sometimes God is going to us. Maybe he's speaking to you this morning and he's saying, how long? How long are you going to choose to to muddle around in this pit of despair and fear and not trusting me versus get up, trust, rest, live in a sovereign, all-seeing God? A bit of a preacher side note right there. He tells Samuel, look, I've rejected Saul from being king. I need you to take up your horn. It's the horn. They would put oil into it. And he says, take this horn, take this oil, go and anoint the next king of Israel. And he gives them some very specific instruction on where, excuse me, on where to do this. He says, I want you to go to Jesse in Bethlehem and anoint the one I tell you to. Because God says, I have provided for myself, I have chosen for myself a king. Now, let me just unpack verses 2 through 5 real quick. you got to understand that all this is kind of happening behind the scenes. The Lord is communicating with Samuel. And at this point, the nation of Israel still believes Saul is their king. And so Samuel's a little fearful at this point of of stepping out into this and says, hey, if Saul finds out that I'm trying to anoint someone else, he's going to kill me. And so God says, I want you to go to Jesse in Bethlehem. I want you to take a sacrifice. I want you to consecrate yourself and them and come apart and offer a sacrifice. And there I will reveal to you who the next king will be. 
And so we see Samuel going forth and doing all these things. Now, I do want us just to jump back to verse 1 for a moment because there's two very interesting facts that I don't want us to overlook. These are very, very important as we understand and and believe this truth that God is an all-sovereign, all-seeing God in full control of human history, in full control of Samuel's life, in Saul's life, in Jesse's life, and also in this new character we're going to be introduced to by the name of David. First of all, we see Samuel is told, I need you to go to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. It was here that Samuel was to go and anoint a king who would rule and reign on behalf of God and his people. Now, what's very interesting here is we need to, we need to just, and just tuck this away, and it will continue to unpack as we move through our rain series here at West Village. But it's very important to note that the person mentioned is Jesse, because Jesse was from the tribe of Judah. Israel was broken up into 12 tribes, kind of 12 sections, so to speak. And Jesse happened to be of the section of the tribe of Judah. He also lived in the town of Bethlehem. And it was here that Samuel would go and anoint a king. The larger biblical story, and we don't have time to unpack it all, and we'll revisit it here a little bit yet this morning, but the larger biblical story is this. As we move through all of human history, the meta narrative, the story of Scripture, we will see over and over again that the tribe of Judah, Bethlehem, and this concept of anointing, the word anoint literally means Messiah or Christ. And so we see even here in God's sovereign plan as the one who sees all of human history and sees you is beginning to orchestrate, not beginning, he's continuing to orchestrate human history. And he's beginning now to prepare the way for the ultimate king who would come, that is Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, who would come from the line of Judah from Bethlehem. It's incredible, incredible at how God is unpacking human history for us. And I want us to see that as well in verse 1. See, Samuel is grieving, and God says, how long, Samuel? God, in essence, is saying, I've got this. And he's saying that to us as well today. I've got this. And he says for himself in verse 1, I have provided for myself. I have chosen for myself a king. What's interesting here, the root word that is used is actually used numerous times throughout this passage. And it carries with it the idea of see or look or seeing. And so you could also translate what God says to Samuel here in verse 1 as this, I have seen for myself a king. Now what's also interesting is that this, this word, this concept is used numerous times throughout because we're introduced to this word again down in verse 6. So just look with me now again at verse 6. It says, when they came... So Samuel is there, he's he's preparing, he's offering the sacrifice, and when Jesse and his sons come, it says, when they came, Samuel looked upon them. Same root word being used here. And as he sees this first son of Jesse come, he must have been a a, a big, strapping young man. Um, You know, you're trying to envision what he would look like, and obviously impressive to look like, maybe, maybe kingly looking, and Samuel goes either in desperation or he's looking and going, well, this guy looks kingly enough, and he says, all right, this is going to be the one, and he gets the horn, and he's getting ready to anoint him, set him apart as the next king, and God says no. God says no. Because as we go to verse 7, it explains how God sees And again, the same root word that is used here. God says, look, I've rejected him. Don't don't look on his appearance, he says in verse 7. He says, I've rejected him. God says, I've rejected him. Why? Because the Lord, the Lord sees us 
and he sees human history, and he sees all things. He sees differently than us. He's not so concerned about what's going on on the outside. He's concerned about what's going on in our hearts. That's why it didn't work for Saul. Right? We've seen that over these past few weeks. Saul looked like a king. But his heart was far from God. And God saw that and God knew that. And what God's after now is a king that would be after his own heart. I read this this week. It says this. Human beings are often impressed and therefore often deceived by what their eyes tell them. That's a whole sermon right there. Human beings are often impressed and therefore often deceived by what their eyes tell them. God says there in verse 7, Samuel, look, I've rejected this one you're looking at and you think is king. Why? Because I can see his heart and he's not the one. You see, God is our sovereign, all-seeing God. Can I give you this principle? We must surrender our lives to a sovereign God who sees the whole picture of human history and yet intimately knows the condition of our hearts. That blows me away. That this God who is big enough to see all of human history, sovereign enough to be putting, in essence, the the puzzle of human history together, also loves us so deeply and so intimately that he knows our innermost thoughts. He knows what's going on inside of us. And so listen, we live in a world where we exert a lot of energy trying to portray an image to the world, don't we? We really do. We spend a lot of time and energy and we feel the pressure in this world in which we live to to portray to the world, maybe I'm the perfect mom, I'm the perfect dad, I'm the perfect worker, I'm the most brilliant, well-educated person in my department, I'm the best hockey player on the team. Um, you, You know, you fill in the blank. What is it that we spend so much energy on trying to portray to the world when God says, look, I see I see your heart, I see your woundedness, I see your life, and so much of what we try to project to the world, I really believe, is because we have a hard time actually trusting God with our lives. And so would we just rest in this incredible truth that we serve an all-seeing God who sees and is in control of all of human history. And yet loves you enough to know you so deeply, so intimately, that as we will see, he sent his only son to save you and rescue you from your sin. And if we would just give our lives, our hearts to him and trust him, this all-seeing sovereign God, let him unfold and unpack your life story and trust him to do it. That's what he was asking Samuel to do. Samuel's grieving, going, how long, God? And God says, how long are you going to grieve? Will you just trust me? Because I see this world differently than you. I believe with all my heart, we would have much more joy and freedom. We would have much more life and love and peace and hope and and time. if, If even in the difficult things, we were content to trust an all seeing, all knowing, sovereign God. All right, let me keep moving. We're also introduced into this passage to the humble shepherd king. The humble shepherd king from Bethlehem. Look at verses 11, 12, and 13 with me. We read this. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, which also can be translated smallest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes. 
I often wonder, I wonder how far the, the field was and how long they had to stand there waiting. But anyways, and he sent and he brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon this one we are introduced to called David. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So here we have Samuel, who's trying to trust an all-seeing, all-knowing God. And Jesse slowly parades each boy before him, and God says, nope, 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 nope. And Samuel's like, well, there's no more here. And so he looks at Jesse, and he says, look, do you have any more? And Jesse goes, yep, my smallest boy, he's out in the fields. He's a shepherd. And Samuel says, bring him. And as Samuel meets this young, small shepherd boy, God says, yep, he's the one. Now, let's just pick apart a few of the things that we, we learn from this. A few things. First of all, we see that David is the youngest, or like I said, could be translated smallest. And it's an incredible contrast to Saul. Right? Saul, if you recall, early on in the series, was chosen because of his external qualities. Here, David is the youngest. He's, he's the smallest. Most would say he's probably not ready to be king yet, so why anoint him? We're also introduced here to this concept of shepherd, that the king of Israel would be a shepherd king. Ultimately, the king of our hearts is a shepherd king. In verse 12, he's told, Samuel is told, go anoint him. And remember, we've already talked a little bit about anointing. It's the literal word Messiah or Christ. So again, a picture of what God is doing, not only in the immediate history of Israel, but what he would ultimately do in the coming of Jesus Christ as he breaks into human history thousands of years later. We're told in verse 13 that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him and it would be upon him for a lifetime and it would give him the power and guidance he would need to be the shepherd king. We don't have time to read through the rest of the chapter, but in verse 14 we're told that the Spirit of God departed from Saul and a, a troubling one, a harmful one, was given to him. And Saul, if you, you read through the rest of the historical account, he continued to live out a very troubled life. He, he, he was just unsettled, he was angry, all that was going on inside of him was just, it was, it was horrible. The kingdom had been stripped for him from him, and this harmful spirit had come upon him, and he lived out his days miserable. But the people around Saul said, well, what he needs is some music. Music seems to calm him down. And so they're all, you know, all the brains of the operation are gathered and said, the only thing that seems to settle this king down, King Saul, is, is a little music. Do we know anybody? And someone goes in verse 18, well, I know of a shepherd boy. His name is David. He's the son of Jesse from Bethlehem. We'll go get him. And again, I hope you can see here God's work in human history. Because what we find is that David, once anointed king, he doesn't go immediately to the palace. He goes back to the fields. And yet God, the all-seeing, sovereign God of human history, takes this young shepherd boy from the fields and places him in the very throne room that would one day be his. Absolutely incredible. But here's what I want us to really see. In verse 18, just jump down to verse 18 with me. Because it says this, Behold, one of the young men answered, Is there, who, who should come? One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is a skillful man, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and then don't miss this line, and the Lord was with him. And the Lord was with him. 
And so here we find David in the very throne room of God, in the very throne room, sorry, that he would one day be, be king over. And yeah, he must have been half good looking and no doubt a bit of a warrior and able to protect his sheep and all that great stuff that would, would describe kind of a, a ruddy, rugged shepherd. But, but I love that line there, verse 18, that he was really known as one with whom the Lord was with. And as the story of David unpacks, we see he was willing to wait patiently upon a sovereign God to ultimately elevate him to the place of king. But I don't want us to miss the qualities of David. That David really was the humble shepherd king. If you were to jump ahead in the story, in 2 Samuel um, chapter 7, uh, God is making a promise, an agreement with David as king, and he reminds David that I took you from the fields as a shepherd. And in 2 Samuel 7 verse 8, he says, I've taken you from the fields as a shepherd. Why? So that you can shepherd my people. You see, he'd be a shepherd king. And all that goes into the loving, the leading, the protecting, the feeding of a flock, David would now do for the nation of Israel. But David was a humble man, a patient man. And he was one that when people looked at him, they said, oh, the Lord is with him. Can I give you just uh, one more life principle here? And it's this. Establish your life in such a way that you are known not for your power, prestige, or position in life, but rather as one with whom the Lord is with. As you trust, as you rest in the sovereign hands of an all-seeing God, seek to be one that is known as a person that when people look at your life, they might not understand it all at this point, but they're going to look at you and go, there's something different. And as they get to know you and your story, they begin to see, this is one in whom the Lord is with. I hope you want that to describe your life. Let me just wrap up with this. Here in 1 Samuel 16, we begin to see as God is working through human history, he's setting something up here. He's setting up and he's preparing the nation of Israel, he's preparing human history for the other humble shepherd king. I've already touched on kind of the historical realities of, around Bethlehem and the tribe of Judah, the concept of, of shepherd king. This is a great historical accounting for us here in, in 1 Samuel. But we got to understand that 1 Samuel is a part of the larger story. Like I've already said, it's a part of the larger meta narrative of Scripture, of the Bible. And God, in His sovereignty, is unfolding this, this, great, this great kind of momentum and movement where we will see throughout our brain study that, that God is preparing the way for another king. He's preparing the way for another shepherd king. That at just the right time in human history would break into human history. And he would exhibit many of the same characteristics of David and yet be without sin. And we know that David, he was a shepherd king who was willing to risk his life for his flock. But God is setting up in human history and preparing us for another king who would come who was not only willing to risk his life for the flock, but actually lay down his life for those he was called to shepherd. Today is the week before Easter, it's Palm Sunday, and in the New Testament, we have some historical accounts in books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all four talk about a moment in human history where this 
one called Jesus, who introduced himself and told the world that I am the Son of God and I have come not to be served, but to serve and to lay my life down in the place of others so that people could experience life, joy, and free. And he introduced himself as the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one, and king. And shortly before he would go to the cross and lay down his life in our place, we find him humbly riding on a donkey into the city, where the people acknowledge and cry out, he is king of the Jews. He is king. He is king. And if you think about the king, King Jesus, he was willing to lay aside the glories of heaven. He took on flesh, and and like David, he maybe wasn't that much to look at. In fact, we're told he was despised and, and rejected by men. And like David, he would come, Jesus would come, and he would come as a different kind of king who would come to serve. He would come, too, as the anointed one, the Messiah that had been promised for, for, for years and years and years in God's story. He would come, and the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He would come and ultimately people began to recognize and identify him as the Christ, the son of the living God, the great I am. And he was one who would come to guide and lead and shepherd with love and humility a people who were living in bondage and desperate to be set free. Jesus actually says this about himself as the shepherd king. In John 10, verses 10 through 11, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus goes, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so it is true in Samuel, we see God at work in human history. Saul has been rejected. This new king is introduced to us called David, but David is really setting the stage for all of human history for the one true king who would come by the name of Jesus, the anointed, humble, shepherd king who loved you, who loved me enough that he was willing to lay down his life, bear the wrath of God upon himself, take my sin, your sin upon himself so that for all who would believe could be brought to life. And you say, well, how can I be convinced that there's life in Jesus? Because as we will see next week as we celebrate Easter, Jesus not only died, was buried, but he rose again. And he conquered sin and death. And so today he is the one true reigning, living king over human history sitting at the right hand of the Father, and there is coming a day when he will come again. And until then, for all who have believed, may we live our lives confidently resting in our sovereign, all-seeing King at work in human history who knows you and sees you differently than anyone else and loved you enough as shepherd king to give his life for you. And so let me finish with the heart of the matter. Like King David, we must all choose who will be the king of our hearts, our lives, and our futures. Would we surrender daily to King Jesus, the humble good shepherd who laid down his life so that all who call upon his name can experience the forgiveness of sin and the fullness of life eternal? Would you guys stand with me and let's pray together. As we stand, as we bow our heads, our hearts before the Lord, I just wonder today, do do some of you just need to surrender the sin of pride or, or woundedness that is having you try to portray to the world something, someone you're you're not? Some of you, I would suggest, are spinning your wheels to the point of just exhaustion when King Jesus is going, all I really want is your heart. 
is your life. Would you just surrender that to me, the loving shepherd king, and just trust him. Trust him with it. Because some of you do, you need to really surrender your fear, your fear of the future, your fear about life. Surrender that fear to an all-seeing God who sees you, who knows you intimately, and is in full control of human history, including your life. Like David, would we just be people who trust God so much that when people look at you, when they look at me, they're able to say, wow, that's one with whom the Lord is with. I just want to invite you as well, if you're here this morning and you've never made that choice to consciously choose Jesus to be head over your life, to forgive you of your sin, to save you and rescue you from your sin and give you life eternal. I encourage you to make that choice as well today. I would love to talk with you more about that or talk with the person you came with. But Father, as we gather today, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are our all-seeing, sovereign God in full control of human history. So evidently seen in your anointing of David, pointing us ultimately to you, King Jesus. And as one who is in sovereign, full control of human history, help us today to entrust our very lives and souls to you. Every moment of every day to rest in you, our shepherd, King. We ask this in your name. Amen.